When I was a kid in grade school, way back in the Paleolithic era, boys' shirts often had a funky little loop on the back of them that looks like this. Now, you still see this on many shirts today, but back in the 1960s, this was a new phenomenon. And we, at my grade school, had no idea what to make of it, so we decided to fill in the blank. We decided to call these Fruit Loops. I don't know why. It was the 60s, after all. And if you saw that one of your friends happened to have a Fruit Loop on the back of his shirt, it was your sacred obligation to sneak up behind him and rip it off. Because if your friend was walking around with a fruit loop on the back of his shirt, that just might mean he was a fruit. Fruit was slang back then for being gay. Nobody back then wanted to be gay. So if you ripped the Fruit Loop off the back of your friend's shirt, you were actually doing him a service because if he was walking around with that tag on the back of his shirt, people might just think he was gay. Right now we're in the midst of a sermon series where we are exploring the fruit of the Spirit. That's the phrase that the Apostle Paul uses. The idea is that there are certain core characteristics that should mark, that should tag, that should be a dead giveaway to others that we are followers of Jesus. After all, it was Jesus himself who said, Matthew 7, 20, by their fruits, you will know them. So as we move out and about in this world, there should be no need, we who follow Jesus, for us to be wearing a particular kind of shirt that would identify us as Jesus followers. There should be no need for us to wear a cross around our neck or a what would Jesus do bracelet around our wrist. Nothing wrong with any of that, but without any of those accoutrements, people who encounter us in real life ought to be finding themselves thinking, there's something different about that person. She has such a beautiful spirit. By their fruits, you will know them. In Galatians chapter 5, the Apostle Paul identifies nine core characteristics that are supposed to mark, tag, identify the life of spirit filled followers of Jesus. Today, we come to the eighth of those nine core characteristics, the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5.22. The fruit of the Spirit is pistis. That's the Greek word that the Apostle Paul uses. Now, I know that that word can have some vague uncomfortability to us because it sounds perilously like that English word P-I-S-S, -S, but don't let that make you uncomfortable because pistis is a beautiful Greek word that is oftentimes translated as faithfulness, the fruit of of the Spirit is faithfulness. The more technical Greek lexicon definition of pistis goes something like this, the conviction of the truth of anything, generally with the included idea of holy fervor born of faith and joined with it. Now, that's a mouthful, <laughs> but it can be reduced to this Simple phrase, pistis is a tenacious commitment to a deep conviction. The fruit of the Spirit is pistis. 
So, that's what pistis means. But now, let me show you what pistis looks like in action. Because as they say, a picture is worth a thousand words. I want to show you the story of someone who is the living embodiment of pistis. This is a story that was told a few years ago on HBO's program called Real Sports. Watch this. Can't is not part of your vocabulary. If you just put your mind to it, you can do it. And you believe that? Yeah. That, that's the crazy thing is if you're never given limits, then you think, I can do anything. And if she could do anything, she wanted it to be this. What she saw her hero, Dominique Mociano, doing on TV. There was just one problem. Jennifer was born without legs, a devastating birth defect that had led her natural parents to abandon her the day she was born. It bothered me to think that there was a little girl that was left at the hospital and she had no legs, so I thought she needed a family that would love her and take care of her. Sharon and her husband Gerald brought her home to the tiny town of Hardenville, Illinois. Population 50, they say, if you count the dogs and cats. They decided to raise her like they raised their three healthy sons, with no limitations and just one simple rule. Never say the word. Can't. You said, I want to be a tumbler. <laughs> you didn't have legs. Right. You kind of need those, most people think, to, to tumble. <laughs> well... Think again. The girl who wasn't allowed to say can't was on her way to becoming a genuine gymnastics champion. She started at seven on the trampoline with her dad. And after a few falls, she got the hang of it. In time, she was competing. And soon after that, she was dominating. And by high school, Jennifer Bricker are you ready for this? Was the tumbling champion of the state of Illinois. Soon, Jennifer was pursuing other sports too. Even one, you'd figure, she had absolutely no chance to play well. Until it turned out, she could steal the ball, even grab a few rebounds. And she could make baskets too. She didn't consider herself handicapped. She was talking to some friends one time, and uh, one of them said something about her being handicapped. She said, well, I'm not handicapped. And they said, well, you have to use a wheelchair. She said, just to keep them getting dirty. <laughs> Did you catch what Jennifer's mother said? We raised her with just one rule. Never say can't. That was the truth drilled into her as a child that she tenaciously committed herself to the deep conviction that she tenaciously committed herself to and it transformed her life. It made her a champion. But Jennifer Bricker's story doesn't end there. Remember, you heard on the videotape that when she was growing up, her childhood idol was Dominique Mochianu, a gold medal win winning uh, Olympic gymnast. One day, when Jennifer was 16 years old, out of the blue, she said to her mom, Mom, is there anything about my adoption or my biological past that you know that you haven't told me? Her mom said, Jennifer, maybe you should sit down. Jennifer said, Mom, I'm always sitting down. Maybe you should sit down. <laughs> so her mom sat down and said, Jennifer, your last name would have been Mochianu. What? The same last name as my childhood hero? In that moment, Jennifer said, I realized all of a sudden that it was possible that I was related to my childhood hero. So she started digging in and doing some research. It turns out Jennifer Bricker is the long-lost biological sister of Dominique Mochianu. 
Can you imagine? So she, she sends, Jennifer sends this research to Dominique. To make a long story short, they're reunited now, have a wonderful relationship. But when Dominique was first learning about this, this girl named Jennifer, who was the Illinois State tumbling champion, but had no legs. <laughs> Dominique says, I said to myself, who is this girl? Oh my gosh, how did she have this attitude to persevere and overcome every obstacle in her life? To this day, Jennifer Bricker supports herself as a gymnast and acrobat who's traveled with Britney Spears, who's performed in, in prestigious venues like the Lincoln Center in New York City. All because she embraced a deep truth with tenacious conviction. Never say can't. Or as she, a follower of Jesus, would put it in her own words, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. A tenacious commitment to a deep conviction. We who would follow Jesus, we who claim the name of Jesus Christ, we who would be filled with the Spirit of Jesus Christ, are called to live with that same attitude bubbling out of our soul across the affairs of our life. So let's think for a few moments. What might that look like if we were to apply this concept this spirit value of pistis to our lives. For starters, it seems to me, it would mean that we as spirit-filled people will be tenaciously committed to what God calls us to do. You might call this spiritual faithfulness. The Bible story that you heard Sally read just a few moments ago is an excellent example. Elijah was one of the great prophets of the Old Testament that ministered during the time when an evil king, Ahab, ruled in the land. Things were terrible in the land at the time, and there was drought and famine. But one day, Elijah got that Deep sense. You know how sometimes in your life you just get a deep sense that God is calling you to do something. Elijah got that deep sense that God was calling him to hike up to the top of Mount Carmel and not come back down again until it rained. So he climbed up Mount Carmel, got down on his knees, and bowed his head low to the ground and began to pray. After a bit, he said to his servant, walk over to the cliff and look out toward the sea and tell me what you see. A few minutes later, the servant came back and reported in 1 Kings 18, verse 41. The servant said, there is nothing there. Elijah said, oh, well, at least I tried. <laughs> no, not at all. Undeterred. Elijah bends his head back to the ground and resumes his prayer. And after a bit, he says to his servant again, go off to the cliff, look off to the sea, tell me what you see. The servant comes back and says, still nothing. Undeterred, Elijah resumes his prayer. And after a bit, says to the servant, go back, take another look. The servant comes back, says nothing. This goes through seven full cycles. Seven different times, Elijah goes to prayer, bending his head, head low. Seven different times, he says to his servant, go off, look over the cliff, tell me what you see. Seven times, the servant comes back and says, there's nothing there. Until the last time. When the servant reports, verse 44, a cloud as small as a man's hand is rising from the sea. That was enough for Elijah. He said to his servant, go tell Ahab he'd better get home before the downpour starts. And sure enough, it rained cats and dogs. What would have happened 
if after the first prayer, Elijah had given up? Or the third prayer? What would have happened if after the fifth prayer or the sixth prayer, Elijah had given up? Instead, with dogged determination, feeling he was called from God, he was never going to quit. He was never going to say can't until the objective was achieved. We, we are called to be like that. That kind of unrelenting determination ought to be a marker, a tag, that we are a follower of Jesus. Where in your life today are you feeling called by God to do something? Do it with all your might. Whether it's something great or something small, dig into it. Consider a simple example. Every Sunday when I preach, I have sermon slides that accompany the sermon. You take that for granted. Have you ever thought, where do those slides come from? I don't do them. I have never once done a sermon slide on my own. Instead, my sermon slides for the past 18 years, every Sunday, have been done by a volunteer, the same volunteer, Andrea Platt. 18 years. I, I'm not exaggerating. In 18 years, she has prepared the slides for whoever's preaching on Sunday morning without fail save for one Sunday, when she was traveling in Europe, I don't know what the problem was, getting soft, I guess, but for 18, she, when she's on vacation, she takes her laptop with her. If she's sick, no deterrent. 18 years. Because that's something she feels God calling her to do. That's pistis. It might also be insanity, but that is pistis. In fact, there's the fine line <laughs> between tenacious commitment and insanity. Where in your life is God calling you to do something? Dig in. Do it. This is application principle number one. Spirit-filled people are tenaciously committed to what God calls them to do. Application principle number two. Spirit-filled people are also tenaciously committed to the people in their life. Back in 1997, when David and I first moved back home here to Indiana, that summer, I had to travel to Australia for a church conference. When I was in Australia, I get a call from David one day saying, Jeff, there is this cat on our back deck, a stray cat, and I can't get him to go away. I said, David, did you feed that cat? <laughs> well, he said he was hungry. I said, David, that cat is never going to go away now. He said, well, maybe we should take him in. I said, I don't want a boy cat because boy cats have a tendency to spray. David said, they don't always do that. We'll get him neutered. Maybe that'll... Sure enough, by the time I got back home from Australia, we had a boy cat in our house. In fact, we ended up naming him Mr. Boy. Mr. Boy was the ideal cat for the first year we had him. Until one day, out of the blue... He started to spray. We were beside ourselves. We tried everything we knew to break him of that without any success. I mean, have you ever walked into a house where a cat has been spraying? It is disgusting. It would be embarrassing. Jeff, you may say, what did you do? Did you get rid of him? What? Over my dead body. Because, you see, I grew up in a family where once you're a minor, you're always a minor. In the family I grew up in, there is, was absolutely nothing you could ever do that could get you kicked out. Even if you're a fruit, that didn't get me kicked out of my family. Nothing you could ever do 
that would ever get you kicked out of my family. And so in the minor zero household, we practice that same principle, even with our pets. If we end up with a pet that's not working out, we don't put it out. We find a way to work it out. Because when you think about it, that's exactly what God does with us. Way back in the beginning, we, humanity, represented by Adam and Eve, rebelled against God, but God refused to give up on us. When the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they rebelled against God, but God did not give up on them. Later, as a nation, when the Israelites rebelled against God, still God refused to give up on them. Eventually, when the Israelites were in exile, many of them lost faith in God, but God never lost faith in them. Ultimately, God sent us the only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. And we killed him. We killed the Son of God. But even after we had done the unthinkable, God refused to give up on us. Faithfulness. Pistis. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13 puts it this way. If we are unfaithful, God remains faithful. For God cannot deny the essence of God's self. And if that's what God is like, what should people who are filled with the Spirit of God be like? We should exhibit that same tenacious loyalty and commitment to the people in our lives. My point is not that we will never have to separate from someone. My point is not that we will never have to divorce someone. But even <clears throat> when we have to give someone their space, we still don't have to give up on them. We can still love them. Where in your life today is God challenging you to practice pistis with someone who is testing your patience? It's a distinctive marking that ought to characterize each of us who claim to follow Jesus. A few weeks ago, someone <clears throat> asked me an odd question. She said to me, why do seagulls fly over the sea? I said, I don't know. She said, because if they flew over the bay, they'd be bagels. Okay, so some jokes are even so low, I won't go there. But there is some redeeming merit in that joke because it reminds us of an important principle. You are known by what you do. You are identified, you are marked by what you do. Seagulls fly over the sea. Bagels fly over the bay. By their fruits, you will know them. Would people know that you're a Christian by the tenacity of your commitment to the people in your life? Application principle two. Finally, lastly, thirdly, application principle number three. Spirit-filled people are also tenaciously committed to justice. What does that look like? A week ago Sunday, last, last Sunday afternoon, after our worship service in the Zoom social hall that followed, those of us who gathered in the Zoom social hall, I asked everyone who was there to Tell me, after the death of George Floyd and with all that had been going on, to tell me what one word best captures what you're feeling and then explain the word to us. Richard Hancock said, my word is listening. He said, I just feel called in this time to listen deeply. There's a lot of wisdom in that. 
The Bible says in James 1, 19, let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. A tenacious commitment to justice often begins with a deep commitment to listening with the heart. About 10 days ago, a few days after George Floyd had been killed, I sent an email to pastoral staff because in these coronavirus times, many of our staff are, are working from home at a safe distance. So if one of us gets sick, we don't all get sick at the same time. And so I sent an email to staff saying, in light of the killing of George Floyd and all that's been going on, what are your thoughts as a pastoral staff? What should we be saying? What, would, what should we be doing? If you know Pastor Vivian, as most of you do, she is the epitome of gentleness and grace. But the email Pastor Vivian sent me back was smoking hot. She gave me permission to share it with you. This is what she emailed back to me. I've mourned too many deaths. What protesters are feeling is a rage and fury over the systematic extermination of black men. OMG, don't jog while black, don't bird watch while black, don't live while black. Are the people the police have killed without sin? Parenthetically, she says, couldn't think of a better word. No, she says, they're not without sin. But none require deadly force when arrested. Especially when police can arrest white murderers and they're not harmed. It bothers me, Jeff, that armed white men can enter a state capitol building, as recently happened in Michigan, without the police getting the slightest bit upset, but black people peacefully protesting unarmed are met with tear gas and rubber bullets. Of course they rioted. What were they supposed to do? Go home and say, oh, well, we tried. I'm still so angry, I'm not sure I'm the one to ask. When we hear that, some of us may be tempted to say, well, but... Yes, but violence doesn't accomplish anything. Yes, but violence only hurts the cause. Of course. But before we go getting our big butts in the way, shouldn't the first thing we say, if we love Pastor Vivian as our sister in Christ, one of the family, shouldn't the first thing we say be, I hear you. I hear your tiredness. I hear that there's a huge double standard. Let everyone be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. If you were to have a conversation with one of the police officers in our congregation, there are several. They would say something to you like, I am so sad. I try so hard to be a good cop. And then a bad cop comes along and does something. And all of us get lumped in with him. When we hear that, some of us may be tempted to say, yes, but there's quite a pattern. Okay. But before we go getting our big butt in the way, Shouldn't the first thing out of our mouth be to that police officer, brother, or sister in our congregation? I hear you. I love that you have a good heart and that you risk your life to protect us. But please help us to figure out what we can do to deal with the bad cops because what we're doing now, it isn't working. Maybe if we could have conversations like that, we could actually make some progress. In the Zoom social hall last Sunday, Dr. Bernard Richard, a medical doctor in our congregation, shared with us a parable. Bernard is an African-American man. He said, I want to share with you a parable that I've been telling people to try to help them understand. His parable goes like this. Imagine there's a little boy in grade school 
who gets beat up by bullies. So he goes to his teacher and tells her, these bullies beat me up. And she says to him, they're there. I'm sure it won't happen again. Just lay low and don't do anything provocative. You'll be okay. But then a few days later, they beat him up again. He goes back to the teacher and, and tells her, she says, you must have done something provocative. Just chill out, lay low. It's going to be okay. But then it happens again. And again, each time he tells the teacher, she does nothing. Finally, about the sixth or seventh time it happens. In a fit of anger, he lashes out at them and he punches them. The teacher sees it happen, catches him in the moment, and she is so upset. She says, Joey, what is wrong with you? Why are you always so angry? And she punishes him. That's the parable Dr. Bernard told us. We need to be listening. All week I've been sitting with that parable, letting it soak in. It moves me. Jesus calls us to be deep listeners. It's what Dr. King referred to as the beloved community, where the people come together across their diversities into spiritual community and listen to each other's experiences, different experiences with an open heart. We here at Life Journey feel called to be a multicultural church. It sounds so cool. It sounds so beautiful. And it is, but it's also hard, especially hard at a time when our culture is torn. It's in times like these that people who thought multicultural church was a cool thing may well find themselves wanting to run away and take refuge in a homogenous community of people who all share their same experience. But if we all do that, where, where are we ever going to make progress in this world? Now, more than ever, the world needs spiritual communities like this, and we need to hang in there with each other, and we need to listen with the heart to our different experiences. Because then maybe we can be part of the solution instead of part of the problem. And to you who are tired, to you who feel weary, to you who are tempted to think maybe equal justice for all is never going to be possible. To you, I say, I hear you. But as the scriptures say, please don't grow weary in well-doing. You may say, yeah, Jeff, that's easy for you to say. You haven't had to live in my shoes. I get that. I get that I'll never be able to completely understand like someone who's had to live it. But God understands. The word of God understands. And God's word encourages you by saying, please don't grow weary in well-doing. Remember Jennifer Bricker. Remember Elijah. Remember Dr. King. As followers of Jesus, we should be the kind of people who never say can't, who never say never. Whatever it takes, however long it takes, we shall overcome someday if we remain faithful. A tenacious commitment to a deep conviction. Where in your life today is God calling you to make or renew a deep 
commitment.